Hey, hello, everybody. This is uh, Old Buck Dale, and with me is Old Buck Dave. And uh, we're on episode, what, 146? 146. Good guess. Yeah, we're, we're trucking right along, man. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, this episode is uh, uh, basically after we had a uh, real nice coffee uh, get together. We had a wonderful uh, time. Yeah, we had a wonderful time. We had the place to ourselves that day, and uh, we ran ran the gamut of some ideas, and we have some stuff we uh, think everybody might be interested in. So, so anyhow, you uh, you had some a letter from afar. Oh or something yeah, well have... we got uh, yeah VV one Vintage Vixen one sent us uh, sent us two voice messages, which was great. Uh, the one dealt with our our discussion on UFOs or UAPs or UAFs whatever letters of the <laughs> alphabet you want to use this week, this week. But she said, Hey, you remember Kecksburg? Remember Kecksburg? I do remember, Ke but I don't remember the memory thing about a UFO thing. I know the name of Kecksburg. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll remind you then. It's in Pennsylvania. It is. Yeah. It's near where we used to live. Uh, it's probably, I don't know, half an hour or so. Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, December 9th, 1965. A fiery object was seen streaking across six states in Canada, okay? And it landed in Kecksburg, which is this little little town of about 17 people um, in, in uh, western Pennsylvania, southwestern Pennsylvania. It's about, uh, I don't know, 40 miles or so southeast of Pittsburgh. Yeah, so, somewhere in the hills out there. So, yeah. so a lot of people saw it streaking across the sky. Some people saw it kind of come in for a landing, and it wasn't really a crash landing. They said it would seem like a controlled landing. And um, oh. <laughs> so, several people did, you know, tracked it down. They saw it on the ground. But within, within an hour, the military showed up, okay, and hauled it away. They also took some contents out of it. It turns out, uh, well, I'm not going to, I'll tell you about that later. So, so they put it on a, on a flatbed truck, took it away. And, uh, the government said it's a meteorite. Don't and, worry about it. And no, no photos of any of that. No, no witnesses that are still no, well, alive. To... There, there were witnesses that saw it, but nobody got any photos. No, the government was on this thing. Like, you know, like flies on, you know what? And, uh, <clears throat> so they said, Oh, you know, uh, it's a meteorite. We want to collect it. And that makes perfect sense to me makes because of the, the, the metals or the uh, materials there. And what, what streaks across the sky like that and land? I don't, yeah. I don't think it could have been that big and uh, land that softly, frankly. So as, as Judith said, she had a, she has a friend who, who either witnessed it or talked to somebody who was involved in the removal. I'd have to listen to the voicemail again. So I, I apologize, <laughs> VV1. But the, the person said, well, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. That <laughs> okay. Yeah, immediately. Yeah. So there's been, you know, there's been a lot of controversy over the years. They've done a couple, I know at least one TV show, maybe two on, on the whole thing. Um, so. Well, uh, there, therein lies the excitement of it is yeah, to the, perpetu yeah. perpetuate the uh, mystery. The, the, well, the good news is the Kecksburg fire department has a, has a, a celebration every year. And. <laughs> To raise money. To raise money. So, you know, for so Flying Saucer Day. It looks like an acorn. There's there's a model there. Um, well, so here, but here's, let's here's give a big shout out to everybody in Kecksburg. Ex Kecksburg. <laughs> so here's here's the bad news. It's, uh, the mystery seems to have been solved. Okay. I read a couple articles where they say this is probably likely what it was. Okay. Uh, what, it, what it probably was, I'm was... Listening. It was probably a satellite, a spy satellite that was launched two days earlier and it fell out of orbit. Okay. If it, it was shaped like this, uh, I don't know, it was a GE. Acorn? GE. It's shaped like an acorn. Kind of, it's a GE re entry vehicle kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it and it had thrusters and everything, which is, which is what led it to make, you know, not, not, a, not necessarily a crash landing. It was kind of a controlled landing actually. Well, see, that would have been, that would have been secret stuff that I would have wanted to kept secret if I was military, that you had an actual a vehicle that could use thrusters for a soft landing. 
Well, they did. Yeah. They certainly wanted to keep it a secret because yeah, we, we didn't we didn't admit to having any spy satellites. So, well, we don't have any spy satellites. Well, we did have spy satellites, and this was the spy on the Soviet Union. So that's the uh, you know I hate to break everybody's bubble, but you know that's pro again it's probably what happened. Okay, there's you know there's no way you know the government has not said a hundred percent. Yeah, that's what it is. But I'm kind of like eh, it might be it. <laughs> so anyway. So that's the that's the ongoing. Uh... Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna give him credit for that. Uh, it makes perfect sense, and that kind of stuff I would imagine uh, deserved to be kept secret. But the the uh, you know body parts and uh, and the other ship <laughs> spaceship yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, we'll let let's, let's let all that play out. I I have uh, you know I got my feelings on that, and uh, and oh, yeah. I'll, like oh. I said, big shout out to Kick for. People, uh, people also saw them taking something out of it and out of out of the uh, the vessel and putting it in a box and carting the camera it. the camera uh, it was apparently it was it was had an it was atomic powered okay it had, <laughs> it had a little a little uh, you know atomic a little, little atomic motor in it a little atomic reactor <laughs> that was powering the electronics or something anyway uh, allegedly allegedly okay so well, that's it. That's it. Huh? <laughs> that's, that's so. That's my story. What well, do you we, have? <laughs> well, my story is that we didn't we didn't bring that up when we were having coffee. But uh, it's interesting that you mentioned it uh, when we were having coffee. We were talking about uh, some books, and uh, we were talking about some uh, some boats, um, and we were talking about uh, the trip and everything. So. Um, I heard you. I heard you mention something about uh, you sent me something about the lantern fly. You remember years ago we talked about the lantern fly. You were like the first. You read an obscure article in an obscure journal, and you talked about the lantern and I, fly. I, and I said, "Look out for this bug!" And here it's going to be a mess. It. Boy, is it a mess! Yeah, it's really. So this was up uh, a story out of the Pittsburgh area. Well, you tell us about it. You saw it. There's a the uh, school Carnegie Mellon. Students figured out a way to program a robot to identify these uh, the larvae or the eggs of this lanternfly, which is apparently all over a bridge, it's all over everything. Yeah, yeah, they'll attach to anything, uh, and this robot will move around, and as it spots these things, it'll it'll kill them. Yeah. And I was trying to imagine, I was trying to imagine how that would work on something like the superstructure of a bridge. Mm -hmm. Plus, an, an not autonomous robot walking around the neighborhood. Though. Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I think the lanternfly is going to win in this one until it really, really, you know, be, gets like, uh, you know, you're spraying with the giant airplanes over the whole whole neighborhood or something. That's going to, but it's an interesting, interesting phenomenon that some uh, artificial intelligence could be used to do something like that. I can see track down a couple of them, maybe on one location, on one tree, in one forest, but oh my. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. That's, we'll be there'll be more to hear, more to talk about that. More to talk about. Hey, I I wanted to tell you while we while we have a chance. Uh, did you we we mentioned the book, uh, the uh, cloudy cloud. Uh, oh, I forgot the name. Cloud uh, Cuckoo Land by Anthony Doerr. Yes. Well, good people, my book buddy and podcast partner actually had a hard copy of that and I inherited it. And I got to tell you, it's an interesting read, a very interesting read. Uh, I'm, I got to give a big shout out to Mr. Doerr. He's what a, what a fabulous mind to put something like that together. I'm not going to give you too many tips on that. All I know is I'm about a little over halfway through it and uh, you're digging it. I've had trouble putting it down. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I kind of, I'm saving it now for the bedtime, uh, uh, snooze, you know, how to get, you need to change your, change yeah. your thought process for a you've while. Run out, you've, you've run out of <laughs> two old bucks episodes to listen to at night. So. Well, you know, I mean, the old bucks know that uh, when yeah. you get a little yeah. older, sometimes you gotta we do. get something to take your mind off or whatever. We're you're here to about. serve. We're here to serve. Yeah. So uh, we'll, I'll continue or I'll support uh, your shout out for that book. If somebody wants to read that, I would say definitely pick it up and i don't have to tell you more about it i like it so far so cloud cuckoo land as yeah I, I think i put a link to it last you week you did put a link to it and if anybody gets a hard copy of that 
I, I think they'll find it interesting, especially if they like the first book too, which was really a, no, a novel yeah. I thought, and exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So what about Mr. Herman? Oh yeah. Flags well, at half mast here. You know, I was, uh, I was saddened by that. Uh, remember one time I said, I wish he would contact me. I, you, you couldn't actually just go and, and write him a letter and then he had a publicist and yeah. so on and so forth. Yeah. So, uh, he had, uh, a little bit of a barrier around him. And apparently even when we, which would have been at the time he was suffering from this illness, uh, he didn't, uh, it was not accessible, mm -hmm. but I thought he was way ahead of his time. I mean, I really thought he was way ahead of his time. Yeah. He did a lot of good uh, stuff. He made a lot of people he, laugh. A lot of very interesting stuff that I think people copied and, uh, and, uh, you know, he's, he, he left us a legacy. There's just no other person can be Pee Wee Herman. There might be yeah. someone will, try to impersonate him someday, but I doubt they could ever be another one like him. So, Hey, and then, uh, like I said, uh, I see on my screen here that, uh, I was telling everybody that we were talking about the pictures you sent me on your trip and there was a picture of a boat and I had started hammering you about questions about that. And, and you I, said, had, I had, I had no great you, you answers. Said, yeah. He said, whoa, whoa, hold on here. I don't know. I don't know what the answers are. I said, well, who might know? Is there anybody else on the podcast that <laughs> might be able to talk about Anybody else who might have joined us and know anything about a boat? <laughs> no, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we want to welcome uh, Captain Jim with us. Uh, we actually uh, sought him out to uh, answer some of the questions. So, Jim, you're, you're, you're in. You can hear us. Did you get the yes. picture of that? Did you get the picture of that uh, yacht, or what would you? I guess you'd call it a yacht. Yeah, sailing yacht. Yeah, yeah, ship. <laughs> ship. Yeah. You could. You eighty eighty three. Dave, you said it was eighty three meters long, Something and that's like, like that. yeah. two hundred and seventy two feet. So I was trying to picture that land on on a football field, and then, and then for comparison, earlier today I looked up my. The, the boat that I want to see most in the world, and that is the uh, U-Boat 505 in the Chicago Museum. I want to, oh, that's one of my bucket list things. I'd like to see that. And that's only 73 meters long. So I said, 83 meters long. Well, Jim, you saw the picture. Tell us a little something about that boat. It's got three masts on it, and it was rather unique. Did you look at that? Did you look it up? No, I didn't look it up. Um... Dave and I talked about it. He said it was uh, the largest aluminum um, yacht and um, three-masted boat. Uh, you know, everything on it's hydraulically powered. Uh, you know, just push a button and the sails come in and go out. Uh, it wouldn't be a lot of fun to be on it if something broke. <laughs> Okay, so you you you've sailed. We we've established that fact, and you do understand it. Did you notice the shape of the 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 front of the boat, the the like the straight razor looking shape of the nose? Didn't have a traditional pointy nose on it. Is there any significance to that? And what would a boat like this primarily be used for? Just putzing around? Well, for ego. <laughs> there you go. For ego. <laughs> yeah the uh, the blunt bows. All the modern. Uh, design boats have uh, a vertical bow and it uh, I think it sheds water easier and uh, it gives you more water line length and it's it's more contemporary the classic is the uh, the slope bow like the schooner bow mm -hmm. so that's that's what designers okay. are going for these days okay so, so so the picture of the, and I have this uh, on my phone as a uh, sort of as a screensaver, a background saver, because I think it was so cool. So this particular boat is 83 meters long. It's it's uh, jet black. And I, I assume it's capable of running back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean from continent to continent, right? Something like that? Oh, with no problem. No problem. No problem. Yeah. And, that and it doesn't look like a... Like, you know, there's no crow's nest. There's no way for people to climb up and down these masts. Somehow this, the master sails are unfurled and they're winched up hydraulically and they're winched down. So uh, this, some this them, thing would, go ahead. Some of them are rolled in, 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 in the uh, mast. Oh. They, they just pull them out with a single line back to the end of the boom. Uh, that would be... 
a lot of block and tackle to uh, to raise it up and down and, and things flapping and, you know, chance of breaking something. Well, so I'm going to look at that picture again. And I, I didn't see the, the thickness of the boom, you know, the mass to uh, didn't yeah. seem to reflect that. So let me let me get an idea now. If this thing is, it's got obviously a big diesel engine in it somewhere to run the hydraulics for this thing. Uh, Dave said it had a 10 man crew mm -hmm. and 15. 15 man crew. 15. Yeah. Wow. Now that's even, um, and that would be just to accompany a family, maybe, or uh, or someone. Well, a, a lot of those guys will <laughs> My have mind guests. is spinning. They'll, they'll have guests and, um, you know, staterooms. So you have uh, people to serve and, uh, you know, the, the guests and then people to run the boat. And uh, they they they'll rent them out, and by doing that, I believe they get a uh, uh, a deduction, like it's a business. Uh -huh. So they and and I suspect that they rent them from each other. So yeah. so having a boat this big with and Dave, you mentioned that you thought the guy said is like ten million dollars a year to to man it and keep it the operating up and run costs. It. Yeah. yeah. So therefore, they have to rent it out to somebody to use it and then they can get a tax deduction for it. I think I missed a big opportunity in life. <laughs> First, you got to get the money. Can you, yeah. can you imagine what the rental is on that thing? Whew. Now this doesn't sound like a boat that you'd be interested in and in being involved with. I mean, it's just, this doesn't sound like a sailor's boat to me. It sounds like more of a millionaire's boat. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you, you like to sail your boat that you sailed. You really worked to make it work. You, you were, this well, boat is not nothing like that. No, not at all. It, it, I had uh, power winches on the boat on the last one, which uh, helped out immensely because that boat was was bigger than the first one. And uh, with power winches, you could have you could direct somebody rather than you having to go do it. You know, mm -hmm. muscle up and and go turn the winch. So. Mm -hmm. uh, that was so a, you, um, you did have some auxiliary power then to help get the sails out, but but if you look how if you look at the picture of this boat, I mean it looks so sleek that it that it looks like it's not even really designed for people to be walking on the outside of it. You know what I mean? It just was so clean and so slick. And then let me ask you this question: I was impressed by where they could park that thing. I mean, that ha you'd have to be limited to where you can even take it. You have to take it almost to a commercial port because uh, unless you're anchored, you're going to be tied up. And so you're 300 feet long, basically. Uh, you need 300 feet of a uh, wharf. You know, that's a that's a more mm -hmm. than a small freighter. You know? well, yeah, when I saw it, uh, when I saw it in uh, Boda. It was uh, it was it was anchored along the along the wharf there, but it was it was not where all the other boats were. It had its own its own special spot out there. As you say, I think there was like a commercial commercial fisherman boat behind it. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was it was out there with the big guys. Well, I yeah. have another, another question for you, Jim. Would that have a for for having sails? Would that have to have a big draft? I mean, would it have to have that big? Uh, like fin underneath it to keep it. Uh, yeah, it, it would require ballast, and that's what that fin is. Basically, the fin is to keep you from going sideways. Mm -hmm. And then you put your weight down in the bottom, which is typically lead. And huh. uh, so, I mean, it would be tons and tons of lead. I, I, I'm thinking. You, you think they would have something that uh, just they were able to retract or put down. I don't know. Or was, we wouldn't know. And there's no way to tell who made this boat or anything like that. I saw uh, the picture Dave also sent me had a British flag on the back. So it's a British registered. I assume that means that's who it's registered it was, to, right? I think it was British Virgin Islands registration. Uh -huh. Yeah. See, they, they use that. It's called a flag of convenience. That's why a lot of boats are registered in Panama. Ah. They, they okay. don't have the same... Uh, rules and regulations uh that the united states so a lot of u.s ships are flagged or owners 
or flagged out of Panama. Mm -hmm. So hmm. it's uh, it's just cheaper to to operate a boat under their rules. Okay. So so this is uh, this boat is capable of well going from continent to continent. I'm 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 sure um, the person who owns it uh, uh, is very wealthy. <laughs> I, I would say that. How many meters was it? Eighty-three, David. I think I think it was eighty-one. It might have been eighty-three, but eighty-one sticks in my head. But um, you know, that's it was still it was, bigger than the submarine. It was originally so built built by a Taiwanese gazillionaire, and he yeah. subsequently sold it to some some conglomerate or something. You know that, and they and they rent it out. I guess mm -hmm. he got he got tired of it. I don't know. <laughs> It's probably would do about 15 to 16 knots, 17 knots. And it's haul speed. That's a speed that non-planing boats are limited to. And um, so that's so, not that fast, is it? That's not that fast, 15 no, knots. No, if they get out in the, in the open ocean and they start surfing, then they can get up, you know, they get over 20. Oh, okay. Yeah, I recall it something. I recall reading twenty one in in the, in all the notes that I that okay. I read. So that that would kind of make sense. That would fit that. But yeah, well, it's, it's not going to cruise at twenty one, but it can it can peak at twenty one, maybe. Well, it might it might be maximum cruise, but then you burn a lot of fuel. So they'll get into uh, their uh, hull speed, which is. If you ever see a tugboat and you see the water in the bows being pushed up and the back of the boat is is the water you know, and there's a belly in the tug. Mm -hmm. OK, that's his haul speed. He's pushing up a hill and then in, in, in the front and in the back, he's being pushed by the wake. So that, and he can't exceed that. It's a non-planing haul. And there's a formula for that. Uh, OK. Yeah. So is isn't that interesting? Yeah. So either you have a, a semi-planing or planing hull, or a uh, hull that has to stay in its uh, uh, non-planing and in its waterline length. You know. So it's the formula is one and a half times the square root of the waterline length. Okay. Write that so, down, Dell. <laughs> yeah, I'm calculating that in my head right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, th those boats are limited, and uh, well, let me the boats that they have now, the con the, the boats that they're racing now, and in America's Cups, they do fifty knots. They have yeah. foils, but, but they go up on hydrofoils Foil. or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. that's I mean, they're that's they're incredible. <laughs> they're scary fast. Hey yeah. Jim, let me let me run this by you. you. Looking at the picture, is that is that a boat that you would would enjoy being on, or like to pilot, or is that something you would, you know, you would uh, I, a captain? Would you want to be involved in a boat like that just for fun of it, or just? To I, go out I, I couldn't say that I would because of the the crowd that I'd have to run with. Ah. <laughs> Well, that's yeah. interesting because what could you do? I mean, be all the obnoxious old white guys. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's where you were going, but that's where I, that's what I was. Well, thinking. I, um, I, I, I run with a different crowd. I like to go to the beach at night and have a fire and, you know, tell tales and, and, uh, drink beer, you know, uh, okay. I'm not a, a, a yacht club type. I kind of figured. Well, that. that's a, that's an interesting comparison because this is definitely no. I mean, if you're on this boat either as a guest or owner, you're you're, you're not about to get your feet wet. That's for sure. You know, there's no way. Yeah, you're going to have people get you close to the dock. Well, it was a it was a fascinating uh, uh, picture. I thought it was. I never saw a boat like that before. And then, like I said. Uh, Dave and I over coffee, we were, I was really uh, asking him a lot of questions and I said, who would know? I'm glad he contacted you. Uh, glad he, uh, you were able to stop by. So while we got you here, what, what have you been up to? Yeah. What's, you mentioned what's up with telling with tales. You? you got a, you got a tale for us today. A well, I was tale? working on one. Uh, uh, and it was about the first time I did a circumnavigation 
and uh, came out of uh, Phuket, Thailand, and ended up in uh, Israel, went up the Red Sea. And that was in uh, 99. So there was, the world hadn't blown up at that point. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I was, it's, was typing it out, you know, some bullet points and stuff like that. And it just, you know, I, I don't know, you know, it's, it's a long tail. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so uh, we started in Thailand, went to Sri Lanka, uh, went into uh, Port of Colombo. And uh, when you come in, you're under, somebody's got machine guns on you. That's when the Tamil Tigers were uh, were running. Uh, they had occupied a portion of that country and they had attacked the police station just a couple of nights before. So mm -hmm. we were in somebody's crosshairs, and you could you could only come in in the daytime. We toured the uh, Sri Lanka, and uh, it was interesting. And then we took off. We took off for Oman, which was 1,200 miles away, and we had to uh, go around the tip of India. And every now and then, a fishing boat would see you, and they would um, they'd come your way. They might want to trade or see they get, you know, you pay them money for fish. And I could always outrun them, you know, with a cat. You can, uh, and you got any wind at all, you can start surfing. And they're, those boats are generally underpowered. And uh, we went to Oman and uh, then went into a port of Aden in Yemen. And uh, uh, Oman was plush. They were very, very wealthy and uh, very strict. And uh, women had were covered up head to toe. You couldn't see their feet. They had gloves on, they had the full burqa. Yemen, it wasn't the same way. They, uh, someone would wear a hijab, you know, the head covering, and I was would be, um, you know, allowed just to wear their hair out. Mm -hmm. So we uh, we were advised to get a, a, a cab driver. His name was Omar. It was Omar with the red car, oh and you wanted God. young, and you wanted young Omar. Young and Omar. He had, yeah. So. He had a, it was like a Simca, an old beat up red car. He didn't have headlights. He had these tubes that were, you know, about like a test tube, right? <laughs> and they pointed down at the ground. And uh, that was our excuse for a light. For that's a all he could. I mean, they, they were, these were poor people. Yeah. But he was, he was delightful. And, you know, and I read in the guidebook, uh, Lonely Planet, that, that uh, the, uh, Yemenis yeah, liked uh, their guns. And I'd, so we're riding around one day. We were there about three weeks. And uh, we were riding around one day. I said, Omar, uh, do you have any guns? He says, yeah. I says, what do you have? He says, well, I've got a 380 at my feet, a nine millimeter in a glove box, <laughs> and an AK in the trunk. Oh, man. And I said, Omar, what's the baddest gun you have? He goes, RPG. <laughs> oh, 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 oh no! So, so we we rode around there, and, and, and I had tons of adventure. We rode around the country at night. You know, we just go slow so he could see the road. You know, and uh, <laughs> that's always helpful. <laughs> yeah, but then we we stopped in at, at people's houses that he knew he wanted to introduce me. And uh, this is a long time ago. I mean, they've had a brutal civil war for years. Yeah. And um, so we we left there and uh, went up to uh, Eritrea. And when you cross uh, and go into the Red Sea, it's called Bab Mendab. It is a uh, it's a narrow. It's about twelve miles wide, and you go through that. And so I was off watch uh, when we came close to it and uh the person that was on watch said uh you know we're, we're coming up on a beach and I, you know i got up and i looked and we were we were coming up real fast and there was a busted tank on the beach you know just a military uh, tank that it, oh you know, oh a military okay yeah that had gotten you know shot and was there so we came up and went to eritrea eritrea is a christian country and they had a big mosque there 
that had a hole in it that somebody had bombed it. You know, hit it with um, with fire. So the the, the ma mosque was abandoned. So going north, and I'm I'm making this short. You know, so going north, you had Sudan. They were at war with Sudan. You had to go 25 miles out to sea, then make a you know a turn around it. You didn't want to go straight down the coastline. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm coming down. I'm I'm heading north, and I see on the horizon a uh, a dow, an Arab dow, and about 70 feet long, and he's heading south, and then I notice him alter course for me. And uh, uh, oh, uh, wait a minute, alter course for you or alter course yeah, toward you? Towards me. <laughs> That's probably not a good thing. Yeah, he was about seven miles and we should have passed about, you know, port to port, uh, two miles, three miles. So he started heading for me and uh, and I started heading directly away from him at my fastest point of sail. Uh, I had, had got the engines running and. Uh, there wasn't a lot of wind, but I could I could outrun him as long as the wind was blowing. And they were persistent. That, that lasted, you know, 20, 30 minutes. And the wind slacked up and they started catching up to me. Ooh. And as they caught up, uh, they were holding up these big tuna. Well, I had just caught a tuna and uh, I held up my tuna and waved them off, you know, and they just kept on coming in determined. And uh, uh -huh. so my sailing partner, uh, you know, she was not going to do anything. And uh, I didn't have any weapons. You know, you can't carry a weapon with you. And if you do, they've got, they've all got AK-47. So, uh, so they just kept coming in. And I had a bunch of stale cigarettes from, Thailand from like two years earlier or Malaysia. <laughs> two year old so cigarettes. I got, you know, these these they had spots on the tobacco on the uh, <laughs> you know yeah. you know, yeah. get those spots on them. Yeah. I gave them to people and they didn't want them. So <laughs> I took a bunch of them and wrapped them up in plastic. And I also had my 25 millimeter uh flare gun, uh which like a shotgun shell. Mm -hmm. uh, the size of the uh, the, the uh, flare, and my plan was is if they came close, I could maneuver the boat enough to where they couldn't get directly on me, and I was going to shoot a flare into their open hole, and uh, you know so they kept coming closer and closer, and and I held up the cigarettes, you know, and they raised their hands and cheered, and I threw it to them. And then they went off, they bore off. So that was it. That's all it took. Yeah, I'm glad. I mean, I, I don't know, you know. Wow. Could have know, been ugly. Could have been ugly. Oh, yeah. You know, there's probably five or six guys on there. Was I wasn't scared. I was alert. You know, uh, it was just, mm -hmm. you know, what are you going to do? All right, I'm going to shoot a 25 millimeter flare into their wooden boat and see how they like that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's, it's interesting to me that the, you know, the circumstances over there hasn't changed much. There's always a lot of drama. Oh, you know what I mean? Well, when we went in, you'd get out of the Red Sea at night because uh, uh, when the winds came from the south, they blow from the south to the middle and it goes calm and then they come from the north. And so the ones that come from the north are, you know, it's generally about 25 knot of wind and they're square. They're like 10 foot square waves and they're hard to go through. So at nighttime, you, you can't anchor because of all the coral. You have to go into a bay, which they call a marsa. And you go in there and you anchor and then you come out, you know, and you listen to weather reports, uh, shortwave radio, uh, weather reports of people that are 600 miles ahead of you and, and the weather that they have. What are they doing? Yeah. 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 And if the weather's bad, you just stay in the Mars and, you know, explore, you know, it's fascinating and there are not a lot of people around, but when we went into the Mars on the sedan side, uh, we heard, uh, uh, cannon fire and, uh, artillery. And we went in, uh, 
to walk the beach. You know, the weather was, was the wind was blowing pretty good, and a uh, heard a set of engines. You know, and my partner said, "It sounds like fishermen." I said, "No, th those those engines are too big." And around the corner came a it's like a twenty five foot mako, like an open boat. And they had a 30 caliber with, uh, you know, the bullets in it. And it was three uh, Sudanese army guys. And uh, they came up and came next to the boat. And I said, you know, welcome aboard. <laughs> what, what else could you say? <laughs> yeah. Hello, like friend. Some, Hello, friend. Yeah. Would you like some coffee? So he looked at our papers and he uh, uh, knew just enough English that we could talk. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he had on a pair of torn fatigues and t-shirts and the other guys didn't have anything on. And, uh, I offered them, uh, some of those cigarettes and he said, no. And I said, well, could I give this guy just one? And he said, no. Oh. You know? And, uh, so, I mean, you, you're completely, you're out there on your own. <laughs> yeah. There's no hey, 911. Jim, you're winging it. Hey Jim, all things considered, is this some is that something a person if they had the same boat, same uh, desire, same skills, is that something you would be able to do now? Oh no. I mean, no, so, you have So you were at the right time because it if you 1999. Yeah. If you tried that now, you probably wouldn't get back. You would be uh you'd be you're a valuable commodity. You would be, you know, somebody would uh grab you and ransom you. And uh, hmm. the the people that I met were really nice, super nice. And they were interested in me and I was interested in them. And we'd sit down and, uh, you know, have some coffee in an outdoor cafe and smoke a hookah and, uh, you know, talk. And they were interested in me and I was interested in them. And so uh, that worked out well. The officials were... Uh, they were strict. You didn't do any hanky panky. You know, you they wanted to look at your boat, man. It's it's everything's here. The only place I was required to bribe somebody was in the Andaman Islands. And uh he basically found some money that somebody was hiding and he was going to take all of it mm -hmm. and uh you know confiscate it. And we talked him into uh, just taking half of it. It was like four hundred dollars, mm -hmm. you know, but you had to list everything that you had on the boat, including money, and they failed to failed to list it. Failed to remember that it was in the purse. So he looked in the purse and and found you know four hundred you know one hundred dollar bills. Mm -hmm. So and he uh, he had been on a, a yacht that uh, was about I don't know. 150 feet 200 feet uh called serenity and uh he had shaken them down i talked to them afterwards and uh he shook he sh you know he just shook everybody down and that was uh, uh, the animate islands are owned by india so mm -hmm. the other places uh they were just a, you know like you'd be coming entering our country they were just uh polite but you know firm hey hey jim well, you know i'm thinking i'm thinking do you ever look back on this and say you happen to be at the right place at the right time like there's a I, life is like that like the right period of time where things you can never do again you wouldn't be able to do again you, you think oh, about it that way sometimes like i was lucky oh, yeah. to be there in, and in my life that's the way it's been <clears throat> but uh, excuse me but I tell people, you know, uh, when the door opens, walk through it. <laughs> well, maybe that's the key to all this. That yeah. When the door did open for you, you did walk through. Others, yeah. Yeah, like well, myself, probably stand and say, yeah, it looks pretty interesting over there, but I'm safe here. I'll never get to see it. So, Well, you know, yeah. for, for not having a story ready for us, Jim, I think you did pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to I wanna thank you. I want to thank you for... Uh, for stepping up because I know we specifically uh, I had some questions about that boat and uh, it's interesting to talk to somebody who knows his boats so well, thank you so much for, uh, for coming by and telling us about that 
Yeah. And obviously, from time to time, uh, we'll check in on you. We'll have Thanks. What do you think, Dave? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Okay. Well, I, I enjoy talking about it. I just, it, you know, my wife has heard all my stories, and so when I start talking, she just rolls her eyes. <laughs> <laughs> She's right, well, heard it before. Yeah. Hold right. that yeah. thought. Hold that thought until then. <laughs> well, she's probably happy you've got a whole new audience. <laughs> All right. Well, listen. Hey, thanks very much, Jim. I, I okay. think I think we're going to wrap her up here. Okay, that uh, was fun. Thank you very much. That was fun. Uh, All right, guys. Oh, Buck Dave saying so long, everybody. Talk to you next time. Yeah, and uh, along with old Buck Dale saying thank you very much for listening, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. All right, this is uh, Captain Jim saying. Sign it off. All right.